Welcome to the perfect place to put a practice podcast by Scott McDonald and DrDemographics.com, the best source of demographic, psychographic, and marketing information for professionals. Hello, my name is Scott McDonald and I'm with Dr. Demographics. We're going to talk about something a little different uh, than just demographics. We're going to talk about people and their utilization in your life and your practice. I'm calling this episode, The Real Success with Personal Interactive Demographics. Now, ultimately, uh, uh, it's about people. It's about, do you need people? Do you need to have a partner? Do you need to have people work for you? How large a group should you have on, at your disposal? So we're going to talk on some of these issues today. I should admit from the very beginning that I was a constant embarrassment to my older brother and sister during our growing up years. Now, let me take just a minute to explain a little how uh, this has helped me as well as hundreds of doctors over the years. Uh, this wisdom is based on an article by Jelena, let me see if I can get her last name, uh, Kebmanovic in the Washington Post. It was a, a recent article and uh, a lot of behavioral scientists as well as demographers have been taken with what she said. Now in addition to this, my speeches and articles on healthcare demographics, I've taught classes several times on interpersonal communications and thought this might serve as a complimentary topic on professional practice communications. In short, I think it goes along with demographics. Now, I could not shut up as a little boy. I, I freely admit it. I was born without a filter, or so they claimed. I believed that everyone was my friend and I said so loudly. I assumed that everyone was interested in my thoughts and questions. So, what does this have to do with demographics? Why should doctors be born again uh, extroverts? Well, partly because I think we need people more now than ever before. And I believe that doctors um, don't necessarily have many skills that they were trained in when it came to making small talk, chatting up people, and making friends. Ultimately, making friends, making a good first impression is very important for professionals, all doctors in fact, to be able to do. And that's what this lecture is about. Now, I am becoming increasingly convinced that having a partner is the smart move for most practices and most circumstances today. We need people more than ever. Now, let me explain something. You all know that the price of office space has gone up dramatically, particularly in urban areas. But it's expensive no matter where you are. A good space is of worth. But to make your investment worthwhile, you need to expand what you do to, to include other people. Now, let me explain something. Number one, our decisions have better outcomes when we talk to, about our thoughts and plans uh, over first with someone else. Having a colleague to vet plans, well, that makes sense. I know this is the source of delay and frustration. Uh, a lot of people complain about their partners. But it is also true having someone at your side who is loyal to you and shares in your success is a good idea. Two, we can rely on some support and second opinions when we make truly risky decisions. It's nice to share it. Uh, with technical decisions and diagnosis and treatment, there is wisdom in input. We can miss things. 
having a partner, someone on your side, can help. Three, or probably four, victories can be shared. I think that's a good idea. But failures can be spread around. And having someone at your side who is loyal to you is a good idea. Raising overhead also splits the costs that we have. So it's a good idea to have. Now certainly there are reasons to be a one-man band. This includes limiting frustration dealing with someone else. Uh, partners may not work as hard as you. In fact, I've never had a partner who worked as hard as me. Partners may not share your vision. They may not be as perfect as you. But keep in mind, a well-chosen partner will be good at things that you are not. They are a force multiplier for success. A good partner will make up for your weaknesses. Uh, now, who knows? There may even be things that they do that you don't like to do. A good partner or colleague and spouse will often disagree with you. If partners always agree, by the way, someone's not doing their job. Now, the bottom line is to have a brother or sister, a spouse, who has your back is always a benefit. You have to have someone look out for you in case you make mistakes unaware. Have I been disappointed in partners that I've had? Absolutely sure I have. But I believe that the rewards right now far outweigh risks if you are careful in your selection of a partner. The world is so complex, it really helps us. Now, the author, Kik Manovic, wrote some things that I, I thought were particularly helpful to hear. So I'm sharing it with you. And again, this came out of the Washington Post. She said, I recently asked one of my patients if there was anyone he could call if he needed help. And he answered, there's nobody. His experience is not uncommon. As a clinical psychologist, I noticed that we are becoming more and more isolated from each other as professionals. In the most recent survey from the Pew Research Center conducted in September, 42% of U.S. adults said that they have felt lonely at times one or two days a week. Loneliness has been shown to increase the risk of depression, personal disorders, uh, suicide, dementia, cardiovascular problems, and even premature death. Loneliness is different from solitude. Behavioral scientists define loneliness as a distressing feeling that accompanies the perception that one's social needs are not being met by the quality and the quantity of one's social relationships. Partners are a reasonable solution to this problem. In other words, you've got to have somebody who is as smart and as experienced in your success as you are. And that's where coming, having a partner comes in. There are several common mistakes people make in forming and maintaining relationships that are going to trip us up that I think are worth mentioning. There are four that seem to be particularly important and based on her model that applies to doctors. And I have repeated them on the following slides. Mistake number one. Waiting until you're thinner, happier, less stressed before socializing. This includes taking a partner or a spouse. You think somehow as a doctor, you've got to be perfect. You don't. 
She goes on, there is no guarantee that others will be accepting, but research suggests that we tend to judge ourselves more harshly than others judge us. In one study, people consistently underestimated how much other people liked them and enjoyed their company after a conversation. In groups, among peers, and in performance situations, we tend to laser focus on how we came across badly and how others must have perceived us and our abilities negatively, all in contrast to reality. Unfortunately, lonely people show even stronger negatively skewed uh, misperceptions. She goes on. Those who try to be open to others are perceived as winners. So, if you try, you've already won. Alternatively, those who do not try and those who are closed off to other people or make no effort until success is certain are perceived as losers. The assumption that others will automatically like and accept them is very powerful. So, I want you to try. I want you to try with people. I want you to be charming and I want you to find help. Mistake two, avoiding conversations with strangers. When we engage strangers and acquaintances, we feel better get a sense that we belong, learn useful information, and even become more creative. Even shy people experience a mood boost when they are pushed, pushing themselves to chat with someone else. We are greatly helped when we risk interactions where we don't know the end result of the conversation. In short, the risk of interactions are worth it. Now that's why I say to single professionals, you got a date. You have got to risk something in that social interaction. Mistake three, steering clear of sensitive subjects or questions or, or being nosy. We've got to be nosy. When participants in a study were instructed to ask conversation partners who ranged from total strangers to friends, uh, sensitive questions, the impression left was no worse than the participants who stayed away from the, those kinds of inquiries. How much is your salary? What are your views on immigration or taxation are examples of the sensitive questions in the study. But you'll see that this Im implies that you have to risk something. Now look, I've got a grandson who is a two-year-old. He will ask anything that comes to his mind. Anything. And I thank God that Henry has taught me so much wisdom on the benefits of being nosy. We can always forgive a child, but we, we forgive adults as well. It's a good idea. Mistake four, assuming people don't like being asked for help. Now, please listen carefully. Due to some spinal surgery, I've spent some time limited to a wheelchair recently. There is much that I have to depend on for others to help me. I hate the fact that I have to be dependent and I hope to someday recover fully. I may not, to be honest. There are no guarantees to my outcome, but I have no idea how, how well, you, for me, I had no idea how many friends I had until this crisis occurred. 
but I know now. I have a huge crowd of neighbors at my back. Literally, my neighbors. Um, for example, the teens in my neighborhood volunteered to mow my lawn last week. They've been universally encouraging, as have their parents. My family has been extremely generous because I need help. Do you think that brought us closer together? It did. Now, even Henry, who's two, he's helped. Yes, it was required a little humility on my part, but that is not so bad, is it? The relationships formed in this way have been extremely important and very helpful. Overcoming pride and overcoming selfishness has enriched my life. Now, my partner, Mike Green, has certainly enriched my life, not to mention my life partner and wife, Susan, along with the 11 souls who call me Grandpa, even though they occasionally steal my cane from time to time. You see, they, they think it's kind of cool. And yes, I've got them doing imitations of the way Grandpa walks. It makes me laugh every time. My five children have taught me the real value of friendship. I'm a very lucky man. And the benefits that I've gained have been outstanding. Now, we run Dr. Demographics. We provide insights into people, into places, into buildings, populations. We have a report I want you to think about. It's a practice viability report. In short, will your type of practice do well in this circumstance? We have a marketing report, which talks about lifestyles of people in your area. And we have the new state report, which talks about the laws and the regulations of practicing in that area for your profession. You can see these at drdemographics.com in the drop-down menu. Now, I want you to feel free to call our confidential consultations. I've been doing this now for, well, 40 years or so. And it has come to me that we are in the people business. Not the thing business, not the process business, but the people business. And the more that we can know about the people we serve, the better off we are and more successful, certainly more profitable. But really, it's the joy of working with the people that we do. I want to thank you for watching. Uh, please visit us at the website at drdemographics.com. And I look forward to talking to you if we can help make you more successful in finding the perfect place to put a practice. Thank you.